Rossi. This is going to be our first uh, 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 talk of the, uh, the series for this year. And we're really honored to have Dr. Greg Miller here. Um, if you're wondering about the seminar series, we're really excited about who's coming this year. We have, I think, seven speakers this semester, six speakers in the spring, uh, and then it's not related to the uh, colloquium series, but we do have a research day event that's also listed on the flyer at the end of April. Uh, we have a lot of really nice big name speakers coming in presenting really interesting research. So we are very pleased to have Fred Miller here today to kick us off for the colloquium. And we're going to um, invite Egon Shalev from BBH to make the introduction. So let me first of all just take this uh, opportunity to thank Chris England and Anne-Marie Chan for doing a great job and for organizing another fantastic colloquium this year. Amazing, fantastic uh, line of speakers. So maybe we can just give them a round of applause for the effort. <laughs> what a start for the year with Dr. Derek Miller. Sorry for raising the bar. So Dr. Miller is a professor, um, so first of all, I'm happy to uh, introduce to you my friend and colleague, Greg Miller. Dr. Miller is a professor in the Department of Psychology at Western University, and he's also affiliated with the Departments of Medical Social Sciences and the Institute of Policy Research, which can give you some hint to the interdisciplinary uh, breadth of his research and the translational aspect of his work. Greg received his PhD in clinical psychology at UCLA and completed a clinical internship at Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic, which was followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in health psychology at Carnegie Mellon University, where he worked with Dr. Charlotte Kahn, which was one of the colloquial speakers uh, last year here. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Greg joined in 2000 to the faculty of Washington University in St. Louis. And after three years, he accepted a position at the University of British Columbia, where he was a professor of psychology before he moved to Northwestern in 2012. Together with his lifelong collaborator and partner, Dr. Louis Chain, he co directed the Foundation of Health Research Center at Northwestern, and his research uh, examines the behavioral and biological mechanisms for which stress affects health. It's quite relevant to the work that we're doing here in the college. His lab brings together theories and methods from across the behavioral and biomedical sciences in order to understand the stress health connection, and you will hear a lot more about uh, his research uh, soon. Overall, his aesthetic research has really influenced in many in the field, uh, including my own work. His work is supported by grants from uh, the NHLBI, NSCHD, uh, and NIDA. Previous studies have been supported by the Brain and Behavioral Research Foundation, previously known as NARSA. Uh, the Canadian Institute of Health Research, the Michael Smith Foundation, the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada, and the American Heart Association. Dr. Merrill has received a number of honors for his research, and I'll just name a few of those. Uh, the Young Investigator Award from the Society of Behavioral Medicine, the Early Career Award from the American Psychosomatic Society, and the Distinguished Scientific Award for Early Career Contribution from the American Psychological Association. It's quite an honor to receive. He is currently president-elect of the Academy of Behavioral Medicine Research. Uh, he was associate editor of the Journal of Psychological Bulletin and Psychosomatic Medicine. And he is currently a consulting editor in both of these journals and in the journals of Brain, Behavior, and Immunity and Clinical Psychological Science. And just finally, uh, together with uh, Dr. Chen, Greg is also a member of many uh, students who went on to become successful scientists. Uh, secure faculty position, and both of them are all on a trial. So today is going to talk about the health consequences of sociability and disadvantage uh, in their early years of life. So let's give them a warm welcome. 
my childhood conditions and health later in life not only extend to things like heart disease, disability, and premature mortality, but there's some hints that they might actually go into the next generation so that my socioeconomic conditions as a kid might have some repercussions for my own children's health. These are some data that we've produced um, looking at a mother's childhood socioeconomic 
responsive to threats coming from pathogens, pathogen associated molecular patterns and these are classic common bacterial and viral motifs that cells encounter a lot, and then danger associated molecular patterns. These are stress signals from cells that are dying or injured. And then what early adversity does is kind of make monocytes and macrophages respond to those threats in a more aggressive way. Increase their cytokine production, increase their holding fat, damage tissues. At the same time, the cells become a little bit less sensitive to signals that normally are involved in regulating that process, so they become insensitive, or relatively insensitive to glucocorticoids in particular. And then as a result of that kind of calibration or tuning process, kids who grow up in more disadvantaged circumstances have more of this chronic low-grade inflammation happening systemically. Um, and then across the life course, that has consequences. But this process isn't in itself pathogenic, isn't in itself adaptive or maladaptive. In fact, one could make arguments that having stronger monocyte and macrophage responses and less sensitivity to the addition would be quite adaptive in the context of certain viral infections, bacterial infections, that as a kid you're going to be sick or less. We think that could actually be quite true. Our concern has been more what happens at the other end of the life course with chronic diseases of aging, where ongoing inflammation is the problem. So this very well may be kind of a trade-off where it's adaptive and protective in the early years, but as you go on, the costs catch up. Um, so just a little primer on inflammation for those of you who don't do this work. I know it's a very interdisciplinary department. Um, this is a monocyte, one of the main receptors that expressed on the surface of monocytes, TLR4, toll-like receptor 4. You don't need to know that in detail. What TLR4 does is recognize this little red molecule here called lipopolysaccharide. That's a molecule that sits on the surface of gram-negative bacteria. And when the monocyte recognizes LPS, it starts the signaling cascade, and the details of that are important. What you need to remember for the talk here is that the signaling cascade culminates in the activation of this molecule right here called nf kappa B, or nuclear factor kappa B. This is the primary pro-inflammatory transcription factor in these cells. And what it does when it's activated is screw into the nucleus, switch on genes, and those genes code for interleukins and other cytokines and chemokines and mediators that allow the inflammatory response to go forward. And so what we're going to do in a lot of studies I'll show you is we'll take blood kids and adults. In vitro, we'll challenge the cells with LPS. We'll look at how well the cells produce these cytokines. We'll do some gene expression studies so we can measure activation of these processes here. And that's kind of the rev up process that we hypothesize about, the increased reactivity. We'll also try to model a little bit of the sensitivity to inhibitory signals. So one of the main endogenous systemic response to inflammation is activation of the HP axis. So these cytokines right here head up to the central nervous system where they signal the HP axis to get activated and you get cortisol release. Cortisol, look at that. <laughs> and that's how I check. Cortisol crosses the cell membrane and binds the glucocorticoid receptors which are sitting around in the cytoplasm. And then what that complex does is block NF-kappa B. It tethers up NF-kappa B so it can't go switch on from the So um, that's why when you have a rash, you've got an autoimmune dis disease, you often take synthetic preparations of cortisol, topically orally, because it ties up the signaling pathway that leads to inflammation. So we're going to do some in vitro 
for cytokine production. Neither we nor anybody else at this point has the epidemiology to know whether when you magnify that against all the exposures that kids have across the life course, whether it results in differential diseases. We'll know more in five years about that. But we see this consistent pattern um, that is similar to what the model proposes, which is that growing up in more disadvantaged circumstances seems to be associated with a tuning of these particular cells towards more aggressive um, in vitro responses, at least. We did a bunch of gene expression profiling in these cells um, to look at patterns of gene network activity. And so one of the things you find, these are quiescent cells that haven't been activated or stimulated, is that even at rest, um, there's an upregulation of genes with response elements for nuclear factor kappa B. You'll remember that this is the main pro inflammatory transcription factor, right? This is the one that slips into the nucleus and switches on pro inflammatory genes. So even at rest, there's an upregulation of genes with response elements for that transcription factor in those who come from more disadvantaged circumstances. There's a downregulation of genes with response elements for the glucocorticoid receptor. So it means that in our young adults who came from more disadvantaged circumstances, genes that are supposed to be switched on by glucocorticoids by the AHP axis are less switched on than they should be, right? So that's consistent with this idea that I told you about five or so slides ago, that there's less sensitivity to glucocorticoids. We measure glucocorticoids in these subjects. We have them collect gallons and gallons of spit. Um, we can measure glucocorticoid receptor protein or messenger RNA. There are no differences at all in circulating cortisol and salivary cortisol in receptor expression. This is all kind of a genomic effect that's occurring at the level of the signal pathway. <coughs> There's something happening between the time that cortisol. 
kids challenge their cells in vitro with a bunch of different ligands that mimic the kinds of things that trigger asthma. Cockroaches, dust mites, all those fun sorts of things. And then we look at production of cytokines that are involved in asthma pathogenesis. And you can see that cytokine production in these kids patterns by their parents' childhood SES, independent 
they're giving um, can potentially offset some of the health risks and biological risks that we've seen in other studies associated with early life socioeconomic disadvantage, and also paralleling again those other literatures on academic outcomes, psychosocial outcomes, criminal justice outcomes. Um, a few years back, we got tired of kind of second guessing what these observational findings meant, and um, but we really need to do some intervention work to see if these findings are what we think they are, we think they are and if they have any relevance. And we were lucky to, um, at that point, start a collaboration with um, Gene Brody at the University of Georgia, who has since become a, a really close friend and collaborator. And Gene's done these amazing studies of um, low-income youth in small rural communities in Georgia. Um, and just to give you a sense, um, in these studies, as I said, um, the gene uses this family-oriented intervention that I'll tell you more about in a minute um, with African Americans from small rural towns in the South. And um, the intervention is focused on 11-year-olds as they're about to make the transition into medical, middle school, not medical school. Um, <laughs> and a caregiver, typically a mother. Um, and the intervention was an eight week, um, eight week, once a week, three hour session um, with set the first hour, um, for the first hour the parents went in one subgroup and the kids went in another subgroup. The kids focused on things like setting goals, resisting peer pressure, building better social support, um, dealing with race related stressors and developmentally related stressors around substance abuse, discrimination. Um, the parenting side of things happened at the same time. 
pretty simple measure of looking at body mass index, resting systolic and diastolic blood pressure, C-reactive protein, if there's fasting glucose in there. So it's more of a cardiometabolic risk profile. There's also a urinary overnight catecholamines and cortisol in there, which makes it more like an allostatic blood pressure than simple cardiometabolic risk. Do you, did you recall which of those components was contributing to? Yeah, so when we break it apart, um, in that particular study, the catecholamines are probably the strongest component of it. But we've done work in Ad Health and in other cohorts where we see the effects more consistently coming out for like glucose regulation, insulin, and the more metabolic stuff. So I don't think any one component is driving it. What I do think is that different kids get there different ways. I think it's not a single path. I think for some of the kids, and we started exploring this in a little more detail later. Different kids may cope with the challenges um, that we're seeing by using drugs. Some may cope with eating. So we think that there are probably multiple pathways to which you can get to that cardiovascular health in these sorts of contexts. And so you wouldn't uh, put this uh, allostatic load idea towards the epigenetic as mobilizing resources, say through sympathetic activation, causing a little more wear and tear? Or it could be. It could be that there's you know. So Sherman James has talked about John Henryism. So it could be, and we, we certainly have anecdotal evidence for that, um, that it's this sort of hard driving, I have to succeed because my family and my community have sacrificed so much for me to succeed. So these kids do tell you, like, I go to college, and I work all the time, I don't do physical activity, I don't sleep because I'm always studying, I've got to succeed. So there's a sleep story potentially there that I haven't been able to really get at. There's just a hard driving, I'm always aroused and going story there, too. But there's also, I think, just a general not caring for the self um, in terms of health because other things are taking priority that might cross all that stuff. Can you talk a little bit about um, uh, your measures of socioeconomic disadvantage? Um, so, you know, you started with you know, labor, non labor, and we talked a little bit about high school, um, educational levels. You know, if I had to pick one, um, or if I had to pick a couple, what would be your best guess, best guess about the, uh, uh, the relevance? What matters? Is it resources or is it education, prestige, resources, those things? It's a good question. Um, you know, in some ways, a lot of these studies, both ours and the larger epidemiologic ones, have been opportunistic, you know, going with what existing cohorts um, we have, as opposed to doing the prospective studies where you could more carefully characterize that. So, you know, I don't think we have an empirical basis yet for saying, you know, if you're going to put them in a horse race, which one would you go after? Conceptually, you can certainly think about different aspects of socioeconomic status as working through different pathways towards these outcomes. You know, in our own work in Chicago, and we just moved to Chicago four years ago. We moved from Canada, where the socioeconomic situation is very different. But in, in Chicago, it does seem to be a resources issue. Tons of range in what kinds of economic and community resources family have, families have access to. And that really is the differentiator. Um, education and occupational prestige are mattering quite a bit less in Chicago than they did in Vancouver, where we were for 10 years. I think because there's just a much stronger economic safety net built into the Canadian system. So, um, you know, our experience is that it's a little bit variable depending on where we're looking. Um, we don't much action with the more subjective aspects of SES, which is, you know, what a lot of psychologists have been interested in, and uh, you know, good friends of ours have done a lot of that work. Um, my, you know, my own hunch is that that, that the latter and those sorts of subjective things probably are pretty important in explaining variations kind of mid to upper end of the socioeconomic spectrum, and that's why, you know, with health, you do see a fairly Association so that even upper middle class people's health is worse than truly upper.